Today we are going to have a lecture about the hemolysis, the breakdown of RBCs. You know in everyone normally red blood cells circulate in the blood about 120 days, right? 120 days. After 120 days, red blood cells are destroyed within our body. Is that right? And their breakdown products are handled by our body. So for, for making a discussion about the red blood cell destruction, we have, we have made this diagram. Here is your circulatory system. Here is the bone marrow house. From bone marrow, from where RBCs are produced and coming to the general circulation, right? And spleen, I've shown it here, in which RBCs are destroyed. Here is one nephron, which represents the renal function or kidney function. Here we have liver and GIT. So let's start from the very beginning. The red blood cells in adult are produced by the bone marrow. All of you know in the bone marrow there are stem cells and those stem cells divide, break down into myeloid stem cells and lymphoid stem cells. Then one of the myeloid stem cell lineage go into erythroid line, right? And erythroid cells, right? Let's suppose put it here that this is bone marrow stem cell. Stem cell divide into, yes, lymphoid stem cell and myeloid stem cell. Myeloid stem cell and lymphoid. Myeloid stem cells go into multiple lines. These cells break, multiply and they break down into, yes, there are three types of cells. Who will tell me? Myeloid stem cell, they will break down into granulocyte, monocyte series, erythroid and megakaryocyte series and, yes, basophil series, right? Out of this erythroid megakaryoid cells, they divide into two series, erythroid series and megakaryoid series. Erythroid series cells, right, these cells of erythroid series, they basically proerythroblast, then they go into normoblast, early, intermediate, late, reticulocyte, yes, reticulocyte, and eventually what comes out? Red blood cells. Is that right? So this is a process, hematopoiesis process, which is going on in the bone marrow. Is that right? Now, this is a erythroid series. Red blood cells are constantly being produced by the bone marrow in adult. When red blood cells come into general circulation, right, they keep on circulating for about 120 days approximately. Right during that, they are doing their major functions. The most important function is that they are carrying hemoglobin and, and transporting oxygen from the lungs to the peripheral tissues. Is that right? Now, these red blood cells, after approximately 120 days, they are destroyed in our body. Why they are destroyed? Why the red blood cells are destroyed after 120 days? The reason being, red blood cells do not have nucleus. During the erythropoietic process, red blood cell loses nucleus, right? And because red blood cells do not have the nucleus, right, they are unable to synthesize new proteins. Because if you have a nucleus, then you have DNA. And if you have DNA, then you can make RNA. And if you can make RNA, then you can make proteins. But because red blood cells do not have nucleus, they do not have DNA, and they do not have any RNA, so they cannot make new proteins. So whatever they are packed with, whatever proteins they are packed with, they keep on circulating. Now, approximately 120 days, many of their, their proteins get denatured. Their proteins become denatured, and they don't function well, right? Let me show exactly what happens. In the red blood cell, if I'm making one red blood cell large, right? In the inner side of the red blood cell, there are special type of proteins, which I will teach you in detail later, and these proteins, there are proteins which are in the membrane of the red blood cell. And these proteins are interlinked with internal proteins. And all these proteins are cross-linked with each other. This network of proteins, structural proteins, which are holding the membrane and making a network inside, these are called cytoskeleton of red blood cell. What are these proteins called? Cytoskeleton of red blood cell. Most important protein among them are spectrin. Spectrin, right? And here in the membrane, enchirin. 
So spectrin and encarin and many other proteins make a cytoskeleton of red blood cells. Is that right? Now what happens? The, what is the function of this cytoskeleton? Cytoskeleton hold the membrane of red blood cell with the substance of red blood cell. Of course, in the red blood cell, what is here? There's a lot of hemoglobin and other cytoplasmic material. Red blood cell has extra membrane. If you look from to the red blood cell from the sides, right? What is happening in the red blood cell? It has less cytoplasm and more cell membrane. Due to this reason, due to extra cell membrane, it is having biconcave shape. What it is having? Biconcave shape. Is that clear to everyone? Yes. Now, why nature has provided, why nature has provided extra membrane to red blood cell? So that it can undergo gas exchange. It, can, it has more surface for oxygen absorption and release. So it is beneficial. But it is an example of a small woman with a very large dress. Have you seen there are some uh, dress which women love to wear at their mar marriage parties? The, the woman may be small, but dress may be very, very large. Red blood cells are like that. That they are having less substance and more li bigger dress. Is that right? Now what happens? When RBCs are, red blood cells are circulating into circulation. Listen now carefully. When they are passing through circulation, some points in circulation are very narrow. For example, some capillaries are very narrow. Especially some circulatory point within the spleen are very, very narrow. When RBC have to pass through those narrow points of spleen, they have to twist and turn like acrobatics. Is that right? And they have to do the acrobatics and pass through those narrow tunnels. Am I clear? Now, RBCs have extra membrane. They have a lot of extra membrane, so they can twist through those areas. And they are, these proteins are very, very flexible. These cytoskeletal proteins are very, very flexible. Due to their flexibility, RBC membrane and RBC cell can change its shape. Now you imagine an old RBC, which has been circulating for 120 days. It has been insulted by different chemical substances in the blood. Its proteins has become denatured. If proteins of this cytoskeleton are denatured, do you think they will be as flexible as they were in fresh? They are like uh, old man bones and old man joints, not like a young man. So what happens when RBCs keep on circulating for a long time, when these proteins get denatured, normally in the cells, when proteins are denatured, nucleus orders new protein and catabolizes old protein. But because here is no nucleus, they cannot replace the denatured protein with new proteins. So the problem is that, that these denatured cytoskeleton become stiff. Stiff, hard, less flexible. Now when RBCs will pass through narrow points, can they twist and turn through that? No. So what happens? They get stuck at multiple places. Sometimes they are, as I told you, originally they are what? Small substance with a big dress. Mm -hmm. When they get stuck with some membrane, they try to go through that. They leave a piece of membrane there and pass away. So when RBCs become older, their protein, cytoskeletal proteins are denatured. They cannot hold the membrane properly. They cannot keep the cell properly flexible. So whenever in narrow point, RBCs get stuck, sometimes it leaves a piece of membrane there and run away. As the woman with very light dress, if her dress is caught into something, she just go away and leave a piece of dress there. So when repeatedly membranes are a little bit lost, do you think it will remain biconcave? No. A piece of membrane gone, piece of membrane gone, remaining membrane fuse. So as time will pass by, as membrane is being lost, it will become globular. It will become spherical. Is that right? So this RBC, which was originally like this, with membrane loss, it will become like this. Because the membrane is less, but inside the substance is the same. So it becomes spherical. When it will become spherical, it will become like an obese man, fat man. Can it now twist and turn? So eventually it gets stuck to some narrow point. It stuck there. Now it cannot twist and turn. This is one problem with old RBCs. Second problem with old RBCs is that in RBCs, membrane, there are special pump which keep on throwing the sodium out. As RBCs get older, these sodium handling channels and pump proteins also become 
denatured. So they cannot get the sodium out. So little sodium is accumulated in. And sodium bring, hold with it, water. So RBCs swell up. Now you imagine, those very young, fresh RBCs with extra membrane, highly flexible proteins, twisting and turning around with acrobatics and going through narrow capillaries, when they become old, the membranes are less. Membrane surface is less. Their proteins are hardened. And water is accumulating in because sodium is accumulating in. So they will swell up. So what happened? These become more flexible red blood cells or less flexible red blood cells? Yes. Less flexible. So what happens that as RBCs become old, they become less flexible red blood cells. Now in the spleen especially, there are, when blood enters into spleen, suppose this is arterial blood, and here is, it is going into spleen, this is venous blood which is going out. I'm making a small diagram, arterial blood goes into arterioles and smaller and smaller, eventually very small channels come, these very small channels are called, blood is going into those channels, these channels are called cords of Delroth. So in the spleen, they are very narrow vascular channels which are called cords of Belroth. Now, actually what happens, if I make one cord of Belroth here, it has endothelial cells here. What is this? Endothelial. endothelial. Cells. Okay, I will make a different color. This is uh, the lining of, endothelial lining of cords of Belroth. Endothelial cells. cells here. Right? Normally what happens, normally, physiologically, RBCs will pass through these points, they have squeezed through this point outward into splenic sinuses, sinusoids. So what happens through the walls of cords of Billroth, through very special, these, this is one long endothelial cell and this is another long endothelial cell. In between the endothelial cell there are small slits. What are these? Long slits. So what happened, this is a cord of Billroth and their endothelial cells and longitudinal endothelial cells are having slits. RBCs have to go through these slits out into sinusoids and then into veins. Now RBC which is very large or which is not flexible or which is stiff, which is old, do you think that can pass through the slit? No. 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 So old RBCs, these are you can say special operators to check the RBCs flexibility, biological operators. So old RBCs get stuck into that. Now. When old RBC is trying to go from here and stuck here for a long time, there are special type of RBC eater here. What is this? Macrophage. When RBC remain there stuck for a long time, they will just grab the RBC and eat. In this way from circulation, old RBCs are constantly being removed and new RBCs are constantly being produced. Is that right? This is normal mechanism that in the spleen, right, in the cord of Billroth, older RBCs get stuck. And then in the wall of the cord of Billroth, there are macrophages. When RBCs are stuck there longer, macrophage will phagocytose those red blood cells. And if there's fresh red blood cell, it will try to eat, but that will squeeze through and run away. Am I clear? Now, once RBC is eaten up by macrophage, this is the macrophage then within the macrophage, what happened to red blood cell? Now we have to talk about what happens to red blood cell within the, yes, macrophage. macrophage. So this is your spleen, and in the spleen, I'm going to draw one macrophage. Right, what is this? This is one macrophage. macrophage. I'm showing one macrophage in the spleen now, right? And we'll see when red blood cell is taken by the macrophage, what really happens to this red blood cell, right? Here is red blood cell. Naturally, within the macrophage, red, red blood cell will be destroyed. Now when it is destroyed, what substances it will release? It will release its membrane and it has cytoplasm. What other component is there? Cytoplasm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Membranes are made of lipids and proteins. Proteins will be broken down into amino acids and lipids will be broken down into fatty acids. 
and they will be reutilized. Either they will be released into circulation, amino acids and fatty acids, and they can be reutilized to synthesize more new proteins or to fats. Clear? Then with the cytoplasm, we are again left with proteins, especially enzymes. In the cytoplasm, there are enzymes, and these enzymes will also break down into amino acid, and they will be also used. But special protein which is present in red blood cell, we should talk about that. The very special protein which is present in red blood cell is hemoglobin. So when daily RBCs are being destroyed, it means actually hemoglobin is constantly being destroyed. When we say daily hematopoiesis is occurring and daily RBCs are released, it means RBCs packed with hemoglobin are released. Right? And when RBCs are destroyed, we say RBCs along with their hemoglobin content are destroyed. Remember, hemoglobin is highly toxic molecules. Hemoglobin is a highly toxic molecule. That is why hemoglobin is kept within RBCs. It is in the cover of RBCs. Hemoglobin does not circulate normally free in the blood. Even though it's a very wonderful protein, it transports oxygen, but it's highly toxic. So it is kept within the membranes of RBCs. And here when RBCs break down within the macrophage, so hemoglobin is not released into blood. It is released within the macrophage. Right? Here we'll safely handle with the hemoglobin. So let me tell you that here is your hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has, what is the basic structure of hemoglobin? You must be knowing that hemoglobin has, I will make its basic structure here. It has this, these, this is one pyrrole ring. And how many pyrrole ring? One, four. two, three, and four. Four pyro, pyrrole ring together are called protoporphyrin. I mean, this is one pyrrole ring. This is other pyrrole ring, another pyrrole ring, another pyrrole ring. When these four pyrrole rings are together, this is called protoporphyrin. And in the protoporphyrin, in the center of the protoporphyrin, here we have what thing? Iron. iron. What is there? Iron. iron. So protoporphyrin plus iron is called heme. 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 Protoporphyrin plus iron is called heme. heme. And with the heme, there is a globin chain here. What is it? Globin chain which is made of amino acids. So this is the basic structure of hemoglobin monomer. So hemoglobin has heme and globin. Now, first of all, within the red blood cell, hemoglobin breaks down into two components. It breaks down into globin and it breaks down into heme. Now, this is the heme component and that is the globin. Globin is broken down. This globin is broken down into amino acids. It is broken down into amino acids and they can be utilized. Now we are left with the last thing to deal with. What is that? Heme. Heme is what? Heme is one protoporphyrin ring with iron. So heme will be divided into two components. That is iron. Iron will be released out of heme. And what is left behind? Protoporphyrin ring. That ring is opened. When that ring is opened, it is like this. Are you understanding? We were destroying the RBC. And we destroyed the membrane. We destroyed cytoplasmic and enzymes, we were left with the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin was broken into heme and globin. And globin into amino acid, heme was, this heme component was open, iron was removed, we were left with the open protoporphyrin ring. Now this iron is, this iron molecule is also toxic molecule. It cannot be kept free into the cell. So this iron molecule, as soon as it is produced, suppose this is the iron molecule. Immediately, this suppose here is the iron molecule which is brought out of it. Here was iron originally. When it is brought out, macrophages produce another protein and that protein bind with this iron molecule. So this iron molecule with that protein is equal to that protein plus iron molecule. They make a complex. This complex is not toxic, but free iron is toxic. This protein is called apoferatin. So apoferatin plus iron is equal to this combination and this combination is called ferritin. ferritin. What is it called? Ferritin. ferritin. And if there's too much ferritin, many ferritin molecules, 
they fuse with each other and they make polymers. What they are making? Polymers. Many ferritin molecules fuse together and they make polymers. And this polymer of what was this? Iron with apoferritin. And now they are making polymer. Whole this molecule is called yes. What is this? Very good. This whole molecule is called hemo. Sildren. So we are talking about the normal breakdown of RBCs. So RBC is heme breakdown into iron and other compound. Iron bind with apoferritin, make ferritin. Many ferritin molecule fuse together and make hemosedrine. No problem. In this way, iron can be stored here. And later on, it can be released to and carried to the bone marrow to make new hemoglobin. Is that right? Now we go back. We talk about this compound. This compound is called biliverdin. What is this compound called? Biliverdin. Right? This biliverdin, by action of another enzyme, right, it converts into a compound which is called bilirubin. What is this called? Bilirubin. Bilirubin. Now this is our bilirubin. So bilirubin is one of the breakdown product of hemoglobin. This is bilirubin. Rubin. Now, this bilirubin is again highly toxic molecule and we should dispose it out of the body. Even though it is produced within the macrophages by the breakdown of red blood cell. But this is a highly toxic molecule and it should be safely thrown out of the body. Right. Now, this uh, bilirubin, as soon as Okay, I will make uh, bilirubin now onward by this color. This is equal to this. This is bilirubin. This bilirubin will come into general circulation. What is it? Bilirubin. Now, this bilirubin molecule, when it is, when macrophage eat the RBCs, they release bilirubin. And where RBCs are destroyed, most of them are destroyed in spleen. But some of them are destroyed by the macrophages of liver and some of them are destroyed by the macrophages which are present in bone marrow, right? And because this breakdown of red blood cell is within the circulation or outside the circulation? Outside. Outside the circulation. This normal breakdown of red blood cell is not into circulation. It is in the macrophages. So it is outside the vessels. That is why this type of normal breakdown of RBCs is called extra vascular breakdown of RBCs. What is this? Extra vascular breakdown of RBCs. Now, when macrophages have broken the RBCs, they release bilirubin as a waste product. This will come into blood. As I told you, bilirubin is a highly toxic molecule. Right? And it should be carried to the liver to be destroyed. It should be carried to the Liver to be uh, to be eliminated out of body, right? But bilirubin is a very small molecule. It has a tendency to leak from capillary wall into tissues. Bilirubin is a very small molecule, and it has a tendency to leak from capillaries out. So what happened? Liver produces a special type of bilirubin transporters, and bilirubin transporters are normally produced by hepatocytes and released into general circulation. What is this? This is a special protein produced by the liver and it is normally present in your blood. As soon as bilirubin come out, this protein which is coming from the liver will bind the bilirubin. What is this protein called? Of course, this is simply called bilirubin binding protein. So, liver produces bilirubin binding proteins. This is albumin and pre-albumin type. And what really happens, that bilirubin bind with the, as soon as it comes into circulation, it will bind with bilirubin binding proteins. Now, it is a bilirubin protein complex. Now, this bilirubin is called, this bilirubin, which is now complex with protein, what is the advantage of it? it advantage of complexing the, binding the bilirubin with bilirubin binding protein is, this complex is very large. And this does not easily leak out into tissues. It is now trapped into circulatory system. And whenever blood will pass through liver circulation, right, in the liver cells, in the liver cells, here, 
there are special type of receptors expressed. These are the receptors which are expressed on the surface of hepatocyte, right? And these receptors are facing towards the blood. Actually, they love to bind bilirubin binding protein and bilirubin. So what happens, the bilirubin binding protein binds with the bilirubin, right? And this complex cannot leak out of circulation and even it cannot go out into urine because it cannot filter out through that. I should make a diagram here. This is bilirubin binding protein and here is your friend, yes, bilirubin and actually they cannot filter out. So this form of bilirubin cannot appear into urine, right? And this bilirubin along with its protein will eventually pass through this area and here it will be caught. Here it will be caught and bilirubin binding protein will bind over here, right? With this receptor and of course bilirubin will stick over here and then this is internalized. In this way, bilirubin is transported to the hepatocyte, to the liver cell. This bilirubin, which was binding with the bilirubin. proteins, it is conjugated bilirubin or unconjugated bilirubin? Who will tell me? Unconjugated. It is unconjugated bilirubin. What do you think? It is conjugated? Unconjugated. It is unconjugated, yes. This point you have to remember. This is unconjugated bilirubin. Uh, complexing of bilirubin with plasma protein is not called conjugation. Conjugation is a process in which bilirubin binds with glucuronic acid in the liver cell. So this is called unconjugated bilirubin and this unconjugated bilirubin cannot leak into urine, urine because it's a very large urine. complex. Is that right? Now, once unconjugated bilirubin is taken into hepatocyte, in the hepatocyte, there is a endoplasmic reticulum. You know endoplasmic reticulum? Endoplasmic reticulum. This bilirubin is transported to the endoplasmic reticulum. In the endoplasmic reticulum, there is a very special type of enzyme here. And this enzyme, this is called glucuronyl transferase. What is this enzyme called? glucuronyl transferase. This enzyme hold one glucuronyl group and bind it, transfer it to the bilirubin. So when bilirubin is passing through this area, endoplasmic reticulum, and it comes out of it, now this bilirubin is loaded with, yes, this bilirubin is loaded with what? Glucuronic acid, right? So let's uh, make glucuronic acid this color glucuronic acid. Now this bilirubin is conjugated with glucuronic acid. Now it is called conjugated bilirubin. Now this conjugated bilirubin is highly polar. It is highly charged molecule. It cannot dissolve into lipid membrane. So it cannot diffuse out of hepatocyte. It cannot diffuse out of hepatocyte. So it, it is actively transported by special active transporters. There are very special active transporters present in the membrane of hepatocytes. So this special active transporter transport this conjugated bilirubin to the, what is this, bile, biliary duct system, biliary canaliculi. So eventually we find our bilirubin which is conjugated and which has reached to the biliary canaliculi. Now it is conjugated bilirubin. This conjugated bilirubin passes through this area to the common bile duct and right and left hepatic duct, then common hepatic duct, then common bile duct and eventually, what is this? This is pancreatic duct and this is common bile duct. They make together a duct which opens into duodenum, second part of duodenum. So this bilirubin will come into second part of duodenum. And when this bilirubin reaches here, this conjugated bilirubin within the GIT will be acted upon by different enzymes and bacteria. When it is acted upon by different enzymes and bacteria, it become modified. This modified bilirubin is called urobilinogen. This is acted upon by, conjugated bilirubin is acted upon by bacteria and enzymes in the GIT. And it is chained. 
राइट इट इज कॉल्ड यूरोबेलिनोजन सम पीपल कॉल इट स्ट्रकोबेलिनोजन एक्चुअली यूरोबेलिनोजन एंड स्ट्रकोबेलिनोजन आर सेम मालिक्यूल वॉट रियली हैपन्स सम मोस्ट ऑफ एट विल पास थ्रू द फीकल मैटर आउट यू नो वेर इट गोर्स दिस कंपोनेंट ऑफ आल्टर्ड कॉन्जुगेटेड बिलोरोबेन either you call it urobalinogen here or stercobalinogen but what component of it appears into fecal matter that is called stercobilin sterco bilin so what is stercobilin it is basically modified conjugated bilirubin is that right no problem here this is responsible stercobilin is responsible to give yellow brown color to your fecal matter is that right now most of it this urobalinogen or stercobalinogen goes into fecal matter so most of this bilirubin molecule is eliminated goes out of the body through the fecal matter but a very small part of urobalinogen is absorbed from here this is your portal circulation what is it portal, portal circulation this is liver circulation okay now what really happens that very small part of urobalinogen is absorbed from here from the git and it goes through portal circulation into liver when it is passing through the liver most of this urobalinogen is taken up by liver cells again and liver cell again pump that into bile bile system and it will again go down a very small of part of urobalinogen may go into general circulation this urobalinogen may pass through here and it can cross the glomerular filtration system and this will eventually appear into urine, urine. so normally your urine has very small amount of urobalinogen am i clear there's no problem here right now i will explain that if there is excessive breakdown of red blood cells what will happen normally when red blood cells are normally broken down in your body small amount of bilirubin which is coming into circulation it's get bound with the plasma proteins carried to the liver and the liver it gets conjugated conjugated bilirubin goes to git most of it goes out as stercobalinogen in fecal matter some of it is reabsorbed as urobalin but while it is passing through the liver it is again pushed into biliary drainage system very small percentage escape into general circulation from there traces may come into urine normally this is the normal breakdown of red blood cells now let's have a break and then we'll continue so now up to now we have discussed the normal breakdown of red blood cell and what happened to the red blood cell breakdown components is that right now we will start discussing some points related with hemolytic anemia what we are going to discuss now the topic is hemolytic anemia anemia, anemia. anemia. now as i told you in previous lecture that normally red blood cells survive about 120 120 days but if red blood cells start breaking down prematurely if red blood cells start breaking down prematurely for example red blood cells start undergoing hemolysis or breakdown when they are just 50 days old or 60 days old we call the process hemolysis what is hemolysis breakdown of red blood cells prematurely but when red blood cells break down after about 120 days that is normal breakdown of red blood cells that is called physiological breakdown of red blood cells when red blood cells start breaking down in our body prematurely before 120 days right we say what is the problem going on in our body is hemolysis is that right that is called hemolysis now let us suppose we have a patient in which red blood cells are very rapidly being destroyed 
For example, I'm a patient and I have a disease in which red blood cells are not surviving for 120 days. Rather, in my case, if my red blood cells are surviving only 20 days, every red blood cell which is produced on average after 20 days, it is destroyed. It means rate of destruction is six times. Right? Normal rate of destruction is 120 days. 120 days. But if my red blood cells are rapidly destroyed and they are destroying at 20 days, actually 120 by 6 is equal to 20 days. It means in a person, when red blood cells are destroyed rapidly and their life is only 20 days, it means hemolysis is accelerated. It is increased how many times? Six times. Six times. Now, when RBCs are rapidly being destroyed, when red blood cells are rapidly being destroyed, there is a tendency that hemoglobin levels start coming down. And when hemoglobin level goes a little down, then oxygen transport to kidney is slightly reduced. In response to reduce supply of oxygen to the kidney, kidney produces a substance called erythropoietin. Kidney produces a substance to the blood called erythropoietin. Right? Now again, whenever, whatever the reason, if oxygen supply to your kidney is reduced, kidney start producing a hormone in extra amount and that hormone is erythropoietin. So it means that patient's level of erythropoietin will go up in the blood. Is that right? Which part of the kidney produces the erythropoietin? Who will tell me? Which part of the kidney produces erythropoietin? It is not medulla. Not the endothelial cells of the cancer vector. Let me tell you exactly where it is. You are very near. You are very right. These are endothelial cells, but not of Vesa recta. Let me tell you. Who will tell me that where the erythropoietin is produced? Yeah? Principal cells. Very bad. Principal cells are here. Principal cells are here. They don't produce erythropoietin. They are actually acted upon by aldosterone. And they are acted upon by antidiuretic hormone. But they are not producing a hormone. Right? Uh, he's right partly that around this proximal convoluted tubular cells, around the proximal convoluted tubular cells, uh, there are special type of capillaries, which are called peritubular capillaries. There are special type of capillaries here, which are called, which capillaries? Peri, this is proximal convoluted tube. Around this tube, there are capillary network. This is called peritubular capillaries, right? Actually, endothelial cells of peritubular capillaries, these are the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells of peritubular capillaries and connective tissue cells outside the peritubular capillaries they are very, very sensitive to oxygen. What happens that, you know, there's a lot of oxygen utilized by proximal convoluted tubular cells and distal convoluted tubular cells. So when oxygen supply become less here, when oxygen supply become less here, these cells activate special genes. And those genes make messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is translated into erythropoietin, and then erythropoietin is released into circulation, right? This erythropoietin, once its level goes up, erythropoietin has its receptors, has its receptors on proerythroblast and erythroblast, these cells. In the bone marrow, where red blood cells are being produced, the precursors of red blood cells are having receptors for erythroblast. So this, sorry, receptors for erythropoietin. So this erythropoietin which is produced by the kidney, it is carried by the blood to the bone marrow and then erythropoietin will bind here. When erythropoietin will bind with the receptors on proerythroblast and erythroblast, what will happen to erythroblast and proerythroblast? What is the function of erythropoietin? They increase the number of? Yeah, but how? I'm about to be impressed by someone. Increase the activity of the stem cell? Uh, yeah, no, they don't work on stem cell in the beginning. 
they work on stem cell the hair for example pluripotent stem cell they work on specially erythroid line right in the erythroid line on the precursor cells uh, they bind with their receptors and their receptors give signal into cell let me tell you exactly what you are right that when erythropoietin goes there erythropoiesis become more and more rbcs are produced this is a very good answer but an excellent answer that at molecular level what erythropoietin is doing actually if you take some erythroblast some cell from the bone marrow put into petri dish in the in the laboratory you provide them all the nutrition still they will automatically die these cells have a tendency of suicide they kill themselves this cellular suicide is called process of apoptosis some people call it apoptosis but one p is silent right so we call it apoptosis so these cells have a natural tendency of apoptosis they undergo death but if they are alive they keep on multiplying now what erythropoietin is doing it is the message of life when erythropoietin come and bind with these receptors these receptors give signal and stop the apoptotic process so basically erythropoietin is anti apoptotic hormone for pro erythroblast when they don't die then they naturally multiply and produce more red blood cells is that right so that is exactly what erythropoietin is doing in the bone marrow it is maintaining the and does not allow the precursor cell of erythroid series to undergo apoptosis am i clear yes you want to ask something yeah we will talk about that later yes he is right that actually you want to know that this will give signals inside and it will be inhibiting the pro apoptotic genes which are p uh, which are bad bags and p53 and it will be stimulating anti apoptotic genes which are bcl2 bcl6 but right now we should not indulge into that discussion let's concentrate this is enough for right now the erythropoietin comes bind with the erythroblast and don't allow them to be apoptotic and they survive for longer time and multiply for longer time and erythropoietic process become fast and more and more red blood cells are produced and you know that bone marrow which is producing the red blood cells or bone marrow which is having erythroid activity or the bone marrow which is actively multiplying and producing blood cell such bone marrow is called red bone marrow so in the presence of erythropoietin red bone marrow enlarges the amount of red bone marrow in our marrow spaces become more so erythropoietin increases the amount of red bone marrow and our bone marrow become hypercellular because cells are not dying so they were they remain alive for longer time and multiply more fastly and bone marrow become very rich into these erythroid cells or bone marrow become very rich in those cells which produce red blood cells due to this reason we say that patients bone marrow is having persons bone marrow is having erythroid hyperplasia hyperplasia mean cells are increase in number due to increase multiplication erythroid mean those cells which produce the red blood cells so bone marrow of this person who is having hemolysis when there is excessive breakdown of red blood cells right uh, erythropoietin level in the blood start going up erythropoietin produces erythroid hyperplasia and bone marrow become very very rich in precursor cells and red blood cells are produced slowly or fastly now fastly is that right red blood cells are produced more fastly now listen as red blood cells are coming here more rapidly right so we say bone marrow is reacting to hemolysis because red blood cells were very rapidly destroyed oxygen supply to the oxy uh, kidney slightly reduced produces extra amount of erythropoietin which increases the erythropoietic activity and bone marrow is reacting to react bone marrow is trying to compensate for excessive loss of red blood cells now normally your bone marrow if it is your healthy bone marrow and it has enough vitamins enough iron and enough other nutrients then bone marrow can increase its erythropoietic activity up to how much it is it can be increasing its act in healthy persons bone marrow uh, it can increase its rate of production of red blood cells up to 10 times 8 to 10 times it can increase its red cell production if bone marrow is healthy and it is provided enough iron enough b12 enough folic acid and enough other components 
Is that right? So it means our bone marrow has a reserve power that it can increase its production of red blood cells. Claro? Clear? Now, I said that in this patient, red blood cells were being destroyed very rapidly. Rather than 120 days, they were surviving only for 20 days. So we say hemolysis was increased six times. Hemolysis was increased six times. But at the same time, if erythropoiesis is also increased six times, then what will happen? That in spite of the fact the red blood cells are very rapidly destroyed, uh, hemoglobin concentration will be still maintained. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So whenever bone marrow has a capability of compensating for the ex ex accelerated what? Hemolysis. Hemolysis. And it can do accelerated erythropoiesis, then we will say, yes, patient has compensated hemolytic non-anemia because hemoglobin is not down. We will say, patient has compensated hemolytic disease. Compensated hemolytic disease. Because in this person, destruction of red blood is more than six times. So hemolysis is going on. But bone marrow is compensating. So there is a disease, there is an extra hemolysis, but bone marrow is compensated well. So uh, total red cell mass and hemoglobin concentration is not significantly going down. So we call this condition what? Hemolytic compensated, compensated hemolytic disease, disease not anemia. Yeah, is that right? Now you imagine, if I have some other disease or the same disease become more aggressive and destroy my RBC very rapidly and my red blood cells life, uh, lifetime, for example, destruction of red blood cells become 10 times more, right? And now they are surviving only for? Or 12 times more destruction and red blood cell life is only 10 days. 10 days. Now, still bone marrow, if it is having all the important elements, it will produce. But if bone marrow cannot accelerate, it's erythropoiesis so much that it cannot compensate, that it cannot compensate for the losses, losses which are going on, then we say progressively hemoglobin level will start going yeah. down. Yeah. Then we'll say hemolysis is now producing anemia. And now we'll say patient has hemolytic anemia. So from today onward, you have to remember every patient who has hemolysis, accelerated hemolysis, is not having anemia. Because in many patients, when hemolysis is going on, bone marrow upgra upgrades its production. So hemolysis is there, but if bone marrow is compensating, it's just like that. What? That in your home, a lot of, lot of guests come and they're eating on the dining table. But if you increase the kitchen supply, right? You, everything is eaten fastly, but if your supplies are good, there's no problem. Problem will really come when there are so many guests that you cannot compensate for the food. Is that right? So, what is the difference in number one? There is normal physiological red, uh, breakdown of red blood cells. Is that right? We discussed in the first part of the lecture. Then we talk about in some diseases, red blood cells are prematurely dying before 120 days. We say there is hemolysis going on. Then what happens that usually bone marrow, when hemolysis start going on, in the blood erythropoietin level go up and it forces the bone marrow to compensate for the losses. Bone marrow reacts right bone marrow production goes up and if rate of destruction of rbcs and production of rbcs remain into balance we say hemolysis is there but anemia is not there then we call it compensated, compensated hemolytic disease but if rate of hemolysis becomes so much that bone marrow cannot compensate and hemoglobin and red cell mass start going down we say now patient has Anemia due to hemolysis or simply hemolytic anemia. Now, sometimes what happens that hemolysis is increased only four times. For example, there is a patient in which hemolysis is increased four times rather than 120 days, RBC life is only 30 days. So, they are surviving only for one fourth of the time, four times increase hemolysis. Normally, bone marrow can increase four times erythropoiesis, but if there is iron deficiency, or there's B12 deficiency, or there's folic acid deficiency, or there's some other disease related with problem related with the bone marrow. And if it cannot even double its supply, still hemolytic anemia will occur. 
you could not understand let me tell you i i told you healthy bone marrow which is having good supply of the nutrient can increase its erythropoiesis up to 8 to 10 times right it means even very severe hemolysis will be compensated by bone marrow if bone marrow is healthy and having good iron because to make more rbcs you need iron you need b12 you need folic acid is that right if you are having all these good supply hello now i'm saying let us suppose in one person bone marrow is does not have a capacity to multiply too much its production for example there is iron deficiency or there is b12 deficiency or there is folic acid deficiency or this destruct radioactivity has destroyed some part of bone marrow or some other disease that destroyed some part of bone marrow and total bone marrow is less now under these circumstances if there is some other disease which is producing hemolysis if rbc's life span is reduced from 120 days to 30 days to 30 days and 30 days right so we say there is four time increase in red blood cell destruction is that right but normally healthy bone marrow can compensate that and we say patient has compensated hemolytic disease but if bone marrow cannot produce at the four time production of red blood cell maybe it only double this red blood cell production and destruction is four time and production is double still red blood cell will go down and hemolytic anemia will be there the point which i want to put in your mind that when a patient come and you are suspecting hemolytic anemia you have to look at the both balance sheet that what is the rate of destruction of red blood cell and what is the rate of erythroid compensation so it means when a patient come when you are thinking your patient has hemolytic anemia then you have to look in the patient what is the evidence of excessive breakdown and you must look in the patient what is the evidences of bone marrow compensation now let's talk about those things that when a patient come to you and you are thinking that patient has anemia and you may think that anemia is due to hemolysis first you have to confirm is there hemolysis or not is that right so when a patient come to you and you are suspecting that there is hemolytic anemia first you have to answer a question what is that question is there hemolysis or not is there any evidence of hemolysis or not now how do we answer that our patient is having hemolysis or not let's try to answer here you know when normally red blood cells break down what they produce here bilirubin. yes bilirubin when if there is hemolysis and there is too much ex extra destruction of red blood cell then bilirubin will be less or more? more more so what happens if you say your patient has hemolysis or hemolytic anemia then rbcs must be destroying at faster rate and breakdown product of hemoglobin that is bilirubin should be at higher production yes. so this bilirubin level in the blood will go up uh, what is this bilirubin conjugated and conjugated unconjugated this is unconjugated so in these patients who have too much hemolysis unconjugated bilirubin level in their blood goes up and we say that they have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia what is it should i write it here unconjugated hyper billy ruby anemia that bilirubin level in the blood is high there is hyperbilirubinemia but what kind of bilirubin is high unconjugated so they have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and when bilirubin level in the blood goes high it gives a yellow color to your skin mucous membrane and sclera and this condition is called jaundice this is called jaundice so these patient who have hemolysis they may develop hemolytic jaundice jaundice due to hemolysis why hemolytic jaundice develop because due to excessive hemolysis more unconjugated bilirubin is produced and it is accumulating in the blood and then it impart yellow coloration to the skin and mucous membrane and sclera so they develop unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia or hemolytic jaundice but one thing is very important usually in patient with hemolytic hemolysis hemolytic jaundice is 
very mild. It is not very severe jaundice. Bilirubin levels never go very high. Why? Because normally liver has reserve function. So when bilirubin levels are extra amount of bilirubin are produced, liver has a capacity to uptake extra bilirubin, conjugate extra bilirubin, and secrete extra bil conjugated bilirubin into urine. So normally our liver has capability to handle extra amount of bilirubin. Due to this reason, when hemolysis is red cell breakdown is rapid, then bilirubin production is rapid. And when bilirubin production is rapid, usually if your liver is healthy, it, it increases its handling of and disposal of bilirubin. Mm -hmm. Due to this reason, most of extra bilirubin goes out of the body and in the blood, bilirubin accumulation is mild, not severe. That is why if a patient comes who has hemolytic jaundice and if jaundice is very severe, there must be some other cause of jaundice also. Or maybe his liver is not cooperating well. Usually, if you have pure hemolysis and hemolysis is producing unconjugated bilirubin, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is usually mild to moderate. It can never be severe until liver is functioning well. Am I clear? Mm -hmm. There is no problem? Okay. This is one thing. So, our first evidence of hemolysis is, is jaundice. What is first evidence? Yes, please. Jaundice. That is jaundice. So, if you have, you think your patient has very severe hemolysis, he should have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in the blood test and have a little jaundice there. Is that right? Another interesting thing, because if anemia also occur, anemia make the skin which color? Anemia when hemoglobin less, it make the skin pale. No. Yeah. Anemia make the skin pale. P-A-L-E. Pale. And jaundice make the skin yellow. And if a patient has hemolytic anemia and jaundice, this pale color of anemia and pale color of anemia and yellow color of jaundice, they mix together and they give a color to the skin which is called lemon yellow color. So your patient may develop lemon yellow color. Is that right? Am I clear? Right? This is a combination of the skin color due to anemia and... Right. We will continue the lecture, right? Now, this is first evidence that patient has unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and, of course, jaundice with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Is that right? This is evidence number one. Second evidence that hemolysis is going on. There's another evidence in the body that red blood cells are breaking. What is that? Again, come back. Not only bilirubin is high, not only there is jaundice. Look, look. Is unconjugated bilirubin is going to the liver in smaller amount or larger amount? Larger, larger, amount. larger, larger amount when there is hemolysis. So conjugated bilirubin is being produced in larger amount. So in the when, uh, very large amount of conjugated bilirubin come into GIT, it produces larger amount of stercobilin. So, stool will become dark color. So, in these patients, stool become dark color. Jaundice with a stool which is which color? Dark color. So, in hemolytic jaundice, uh, there is excessive amount of stercobilinogen and usually patient has darker color stool. Another thing, when there is excessive high amount of conjugated bilirubin coming here, then, this urobalinogen which is absorbed is less than normal or more than normal? More than, more than normal. So, a larger amount of urobalinogen will be going to the blood and from there it will be going into urine. So, urine will have extra amount of what? Extra amount of urobalinogen. And this is, so whenever your urine has extra amount of, high amount of urobalinogen, it means RBC is breaking down fastly because when unconjugated sorry when in the urine urobalinogen become high when rbcs are breaking fastly mm -hmm. there's more unconjugated bilirubin in the blood more unconjugated bilirubin is converted into more conjugated bilirubin and more conjugated bilirubin converted into more urobalinogen and stercobalinogen stool become darker color and urobalinogen some of it which goes into the urine that is more than normal concentration. So in these patients, another evidence of hemolysis is 
Yes, please. What is the next evidence of hemolysis? Increased uro bilin in urine. And of course, dark color stool. Dark stool. Fecal matter is dark. Yeah, now I knew there will be some intelligent person who will ask what will happen to the color of urine. urine. We have already said the color of the stool will be very dark due to high concentration of stracobalanogen. Mm -hmm. What will happen to the color of the urine? It's going to be darker. Why? Because of high concentration of urine belly function. Okay. Uh, there are two things in the blood. Number one, blood has, in this patient, blood has more urobalinogen. Number two, blood has more unconjugated bilirubin. Yes. Right? Do you think bilirubin in urine gives dark color or urobalinogen gives dark color? Answer is bilirubin. Urobalinogen no, does no, not... No, just a minute. Urobalinogen is not a very strong pigment. So... It may make the urine dark, but very little. Is that right? Very little. What thing can really make the urine dark is when bilirubin itself appears into urine. Listen carefully. Which pro breakdown product of the hemoglobin can make the urine dark, right, is when bilirubin itself comes into urine. urine. Now listen carefully. Unconjugated bilirubin is strongly bound with plasma protein. And this complex is very large and it cannot leak into urine. Okay. So in this case, patient has jaundice, patient has unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but normally unconjugated plasma protein bound bilirubin does not appear into urine. Is that right? So urine does not become significantly dark. Is that right? And this is a jaundice in which bilirubin is not present in urine. This, this type of jaundice is also given another very special name, that is jaundice in which bilirubin is not in urine. We call this type of jaundice A call uric jaundice. A call, coal mean bile, coal mean here bilirubin. A call, that bilirubin is not there, right? And A. coal uric in the urine, urine bile, uh, bilirubin is not there, but patient has jaundice. So A. coal uric jaundice is a type of jaundice in which bilirubin is not leaking into urine. In which bilirubin is not leaking into urine. urine. It is usually unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Am I clear? Is that right? So in hemolytic disease, what type of jaundice is there? A. coal uric jaundice. What type of hyperbilirubinemia is there? Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Which breakdown product is increased into urine is? Urobilinogen. And of course, urobilinogen is not bilirubin. Is that right? Now, but just by the way, I should mention, if there is some obstruction here, let us suppose there is a cancer here or there is a gallstone here. It means there is obstruction here. If there is some other patient who has obstruction here, can conjugated bilirubin go down? No. no. Now, conjugated bilirubin will fall into blood. And conjugated bilirubin will accumulate in the blood and go up. This type of jaundice is called, this is a jaundice which is due to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. When there is obstruction here and con bilirubin can come here, get conjugated but cannot go down and it accumulate here and fall back, blood develop hyperbilirubinemia, high level of bilirubin, but what bilirubin is there? Unconjugated or conjugated? Conjugated. So patient develop conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Conjugated bilirubin can appear into urine and urine become very dark. And urine become very dark. Very dark. I wanted to make that confusion clear. So when you have conjugated, when you have obstruction here, then you have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, then you have coal uric jaundice. Coal uric jaundice. Is that right? Not a cold uric jaundice. Cold uric jaundice. In the urine there is bilirubin. And in this particular case, when bilirubin is going into urine, urine becomes dark colored. And when block is here, do you think there is any conjugated bilirubin coming here? No. no. Do you think you are getting stercobalinogen? No. So light color store. Light color fecal matter. So if you have a patient which has dark patient with jaundice, if you have a patient 
with jaundice with dark urine and light stool dark urine and light stool if you check his urine for urobilinogen in this patient where there's obstruction here do you think any urobilinogen is formed no if there's obstruction here there's no urobilinogen can urobilinogen go into urine yes no if block is here if block is here is that right what is happening that conjugated bilirubin is going back to the blood not going here so it is not changed into stercobilinogen so stool remain light colored and urobilinogen is not produced so in the urine there is no urobilinogen so actually whenever you have a patient of jaundice in which urine is dark colored due to conjugated bilirubin urea and stool is light colored and urobilinogen is not there this is obstructive jaundice this is obstructive jaundice there is obstruction to the bile outflow and whenever you produce obstruction here not only conjugated bilirubin go back but with that bile acids also go back you know in the liver in the bile there are bile acids from here conjugated bilirubin is going down as well as bile acids and bile salt are going down when there is obstructive jaundice obstruction is here by not only conjugated bilirubin fall here but along with that bile acids come here bile acids when they come into blood they go under the skin and irritate the mast cells and produce itching they produce itching so there is a clinical saying when your patient of jaundice has dark urine light stool with itching it is obstructive jaundice until proved otherwise am i clear this clinical point is clear to you right but anyway we went away to the obstructive jaundice because i wanted to make your concept clear let's come back to hemolysis so what were the evidences of that our patient is having hemolysis one evidence patient has a jaundice what type of jaundice unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia number 2 there is increased urobilinogen number 3 stool is dark color but urine is not dark color is that right but urine has extra amount of urobilinogen is there any other evidence of hemolysis if my unconjugated bilirubin is high there's more urobilinogen in the urine more stercobilinogen in the fecal matter it's all telling that there is hemolysis going on any other evidence of hemolysis yes when red blood cell break down they release enzymes there is an enzyme which is present in red blood cell that enzyme is called ldh this enzyme can be can be released by injury to many tissues many tissues in our body have ldh but if other tissue do not have any injury uh, then in the blood if ldh level go up ldh mean lactate dehydrogenase enzyme this is present in the red blood cells if there is too much excessive breakdown of red blood cells then in the blood ldh level will also go up right that is another evidence of hemolysis the red blood cells are breaking down excessively So how many evidences of hemolysis unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia then there is increase urobilinogen and then there is dark stool and then there is in the blood level of ldh increased can there be an other evidence of hemolysis when red blood cells are very rapidly breaking down some other change in the body anyone please listen liver produces another special type of protein liver cells release into circulation and this protein is this protein this protein is called yes what is the name of this protein hepto heptoglobin this is a normal protein which is produced by your liver and it is right now normally circulating in your blood what is the name of this protein heptoglobin is that right now normally our blood has a good level of heptoglobin what is the function of heptoglobin actually heptoglobin bind with the free hemoglobin if due to some reason some free hemoglobin come into blood for example if a hemoglobin molecule let us suppose this is a red blood cell it break down into blood normally red blood cell break down into macrophages but if red blood cell undergoes hemolysis within circulation some hemoglobin is released free hemoglobin is highly toxic molecule it damages 
especially kidneys. I will talk about that later. So nature has pro provided some backup protection that if hemoglobin become into circulation, heptoglobin will immediately bind the hemoglobin. So heptoglobin is free hemoglobin binding protein. What is heptoglobin? Free hemoglobin, free hemoglobin binding protein. protein. When heptoglobin bind with the free hemoglobin, this complex is very rapidly eaten up by macrophages. And when hemoglobin binds with heptoglobin, it cannot damage our tissue. But macrophages very rapidly and liver cells very rapidly take up the hemoglobin heptoglobin complex and destroy hemoglobin and heptoglobin. So when there is hemolysis going on and if there is free hemoglobin coming into blood, then it will complex with heptoglobin and free heptoglobin levels will go down. Are you with me? So what happens, another evidence of hemolysis is, yes, reduced free heptoglobin levels in blood. When someone blood has less than normal heptoglobin, you must think of hemolysis. hemolysis. Now another thing, hemolysis can occur within the macrophages, which is called extravascular hemolysis or hemolysis can occur within the circulation. When hemolysis occur within the macrophages, when hemolysis occur within the macrophages, then most of the hemoglobin is destroyed within macrophage. Very little hemoglobin come out. So when there is extravascular hemolysis, very little hemoglobin leak into circulation and heptoglobin level go slightly down. But if there is intravascular hemolysis, heptoglobin level goes severely down or even almost disappear from the patient blood. So this is a very important point. At heptoglobin levels are slightly less, you think hemolysis is going within the Macrophage. macrophages. But if heptoglobin level almost disappear from the blood, it means hemolysis is within the general circulation, intravascular hemolysis. Is that right? So all these are the evidence of hemolysis. So if your patient is having unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, increased urobilinogenin, stool in the history is dark, LDH in the blood is high, hepatoglobin, heptoglobin, heptoglobin is low, it means yes, hemolysis is going on. The next important work of a doctor is, now we should look for evidence that if hemolysis is going on, is bone marrow trying to compensate or not? Is bone marrow is reactive or not? Because the normal response of bone marrow under these circumstances should be that it should produce extra red blood cell. There should be evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. There should be evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. There must be evidence of bone marrow reaction to this situation. So let's look for those evidences. Second question which you have to ask yourself is, does my patient have accelerated Yes, erythro, yes, erythro, poiesis or not. Now, what are the evidences that your patient has accelerated erythropoiesis or not? Very simple, number one. Whenever bone marrow increases its erythropoietic activity, in the blood, percentage of fresh RBCs will decrease or increase. Listen. Whenever bone marrow is producing very rapidly erythropoiesis, it is making lot of RBCs very rapidly, then in the blood, percentage of fresh RBCs will be less than normal or more than normal? More than normal. Fresh RBCs are called reticulocytes. Fresh RBCs are called reticulocytes. Now what is reticulocyte? It is newly released red blood cell, right? Or we call it immature red blood cell. We call it new red blood cell. Actually, new red blood cell, it is slightly larger than normal red blood cell. Suppose this is reticulocyte and here I'm going to make normal red blood cell. Reticulocyte is slightly larger. Mature red blood cell is slightly smaller. It is 8 to 9 micron. It is 7 to 8 micron. Number 2, it is slightly larger. Number 2, newly released red blood cell has some, it has a lot of hemoglobin, but suppose this is hemoglobin, okay. 
newly released red blood cell has hemoglobin but hemoglobin is also present in mature red blood cell the difference is that newly released red blood cell is still synthesizing hemoglobin it is still synthesizing, synthesizing hemoglobin and it still has some messenger rna and some ribosomes some messenger RNA and some ribosome because it is still doing the production of hemoglobin. When with special stain, we call them supraviolet stain or new methylene blue stain. When those stains are applied, these this RNA and ribosomes they are stained as blue network, and these are new red blood cells which have a blue network in them. Because they have a network of RNA and ribosome, we call network mean retic. So we call them reticulocyte, the cells with net blue network. Is that right? So when these reticulocytes appear into circulation, within one or two days, all this RNA and ribosomes are disintegrated and they convert into mature red blood cells, which is well hemoglobinized. So they have slightly blue color, slightly bluish red color, and mature red cell has red color. Reticulocyte are slightly larger and mature red cell is slightly smaller. Now, in normal person, when you have normal erythropoiesis, normal erythropoiesis, in the peripheral circulation, 1 to 2 percent of the red blood cells are reticulocyte. In, for example, if I am having right now normal erythropoiesis, then in my, uh, if you look at my red blood cells, micro, under the microscope, 1 to 2 percent of the red blood cell will be actually reticulocyte is that right but if it is producing too much reticulocytes very rapidly maybe up to 10 percent 20 percent of the red blood cell will be retics it means reticulocyte percentage in the blood and reticulocyte count in the blood will go up so first evidence that bone marrow is really compensating is reticulocytosis reticulocytosis means that patient has increased reticulocyte count. If someone has not, he is having severe hemolysis, but not retic increased reticulocyte count, it means there are double problem. One problem is RBCs are rapidly destroyed. Second problem, bone marrow is not responding. Is that right? This person will develop very rapid anemia. Am I clear? So normally, there should be evidences of bone marrow or increase like accelerated erythropoiesis. Number one, reticulocyte in the blood will go down, up. Reticulocyte count will go up. Number two, mean corpuscular volume. The, you know, red blood cells have their size. In the previous lectures, I told you mean corpuscular volume. The volume of one red blood cell, not the size, I'm talking about volume. Volume of one red blood cell is somewhere between 80 to 100 femtoliter. It's a very small size of the red blood cell. Healthy red blood cell has its size somewhere between 80 to 100 femtoliter. Right? Now listen. If bone marrow is doing very rapid erythropoiesis, lot of reticulocyte and fresh red blood cells are coming into circulation, then average mean or average volume of red blood cell will go down or up? Up. up. So mean corpuscular volume will go up because percentage of reticulocyte goes up. So we say mean corpuscular volume may be somewhere around 105 femtoliter. If you want, you, if you do not want to remember this, you simply say that the patients who have hemolysis severe, initially their red blood cells are of normal size. But as more and more fresh red blood cells are coming, or reticulocytes are coming, which are larger than normal, then they will develop slight, slight degree of, a little, slight degree of macrocytosis. What is this? Macrocytosis. This is another evidence of bone marrow compensation. The RBCs are slightly larger because freshly made RBCs are, hot RBCs are larger RBCs. Another thing. Another evidence of bone marrow response is that normally, first normal, normally I told you reticulocyte are only 1 or 2 percent. Most of the red blood cells are mature red blood cells, 98 to 99 percent. And they are, they are blue, uh, sorry, mature red blood cells are which color? Red color. Is it right? But 
if red blood cells are rapidly destroyed and bone marrow is producing fresh red blood cell with high speed, the new red blood cell, the reticulocyte which are coming, they have a slightly which color? Blue. Bluish color. So if I have severe hemolysis, a high percentage of my red blood cells which are coming from the bone marrow, right, that will be slightly blue shade, right. So when you look under the microscope at my red blood cells, some of them will be totally red and some of them will be reddish blue. And we say red blood cells of multiple colors are there. Blue color and red color. Red color. Blue are the reticulocytes and fresh red blood cells and uh, red are the red cell. mature red blood cells. And when there are multiple colors and shade, we use the term, there is polychromasia. Chrome, chrome, chrome mean color? Polychromasia. So what are the evidence of the bone marrow is responding? If a patient with, has all these evidences here, then we say that patient has hemolysis. And with all these things, he has also increased reticulocyte count plus slight macrocytosis plus polychromasia. It means bone marrow is compensating. And the last evidence is that you do bone marrow biopsy. If you do the bone marrow biopsy, what you will find? Bone marrow will be normocellular, hypercellular, or hypocellular? Hypercellular. Hypercellular, right? In bone marrow cells, there will be very abundant cells of the erythroid series, lot of normoblasts which are trying to produce red blood cells. So we say there will be hypercellular bone marrow. Hypercellular bone marrow. This is due to erythroid hyper. Plasia. Am I clear? No problem. Now, you have done how many things for your patient? You have, have evidences that patient has hemolysis. You have evidences that there is accelerated erythropoiesis. Now you have to make another decision. The patient which you are dealing with, of course he has hemolysis and he has increased bone marrow activity. You have to look for evidence that hemolysis is extravascular that is within the, most of the hemolysis is extravascular, that is within the macrophages, or it is intravascular hemolysis. The RBCs are breaking within circulation. circulation. Now let me tell you. If there is hemolysis, now next question which you are going to answer is, yes, what is that? Hemolysis is extravascular or intravascular. Extravascular means that hemolysis is going on, but is it RBC is breaking down into macrophages or in the circulation? Very simple. If most of the red blood cells are breaking down outside the circulation into macrophages, it means macrophages and spleen have to work less or more? More. When macrophages to work more, they undergo work load hyperplasia. As you do exercise, your muscles size increases. But when you put more function on the macrophages and more function on the spleen, spleen become larger. But that is not that spleen cell become larger. There's number of the cells become larger. So what really happens when you keep on bringing more red blood cell to be destroyed by macrophages, macrophages increase their number in spleen and sometimes even in liver. So very classical feature of extravascular hemolysis is splenomegaly. It's a classical feature of extravascular hemolysis, the spleen of the patient is enlarged, right? So now evidence of extravascular hemolysis. What is the main evidence? Splenomegaly. Is that right? Now, what are the evidences of intravascular hemolysis? If someone has breakdown of red blood cell into general circulation, free hemoglobin will come out. When free hemoglobin will come out, it will immediately bind with heptoglobin and heptoglobin levels will go down. severely down or free heptoglobin will totally disappear. So first evidence of intravascular hemolysis is, yes, first evidence of intravascular hemolysis is very, very low or totally absent heptoglobin. Is that right? Number two, remember in extravascular hemolysis, heptoglobin may go slightly down. But intravascular hemolysis, there is a very severe drop in the level of heptoglobin. Are you understanding that? Yes. Great. Now, not only heptoglobin will go down, 
if there is too much hemolysis, all the haptoglobin is loaded, and after that there is further free hemoglobin and no haptoglobin to bind. So hemoglobin will be free in blood. When you can detect free hemoglobin in blood, we say patient has hemoglobinemia. Free hemoglobin is present in circulation. So patient has hemoglobinemia. So patient with absent haptoglobin with a lot of hemoglobinemia, of course it is extravascular hemolysis or intravascular hemolysis? Intravascular hemolysis. You like sounding like a doctor now. Good. Intravascular hemolysis. Then when hemoglobin become free into blood, it may be oxidized. And when it is oxidized, oxidized hemoglobin is called met hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, when it comes out of RBCs, RBCs have special mechanism to keep the hemoglobin in reduced form, right? But when hemoglobin becomes free in the blood, right, it has a tendency to undergo oxid oxidization, right? Oxygenation of hemoglobin is different. Oxidation of hemoglobin is different. And when hemoglobin is oxidized, this is called met hemoglobin. So when there is intravascular hemolysis, met hemoglobin level will go up. up. So there is met hemo, met hemoglobinemia. And then hemoglobin is a tetrameric molecule. You remember I told you in the beginning that hemoglobin is a tetrameric molecule. I'm going to draw one hemoglobin molecule. This is one globin chain, this is other chain, another. These are all four, one hemoglobin molecule. So one hemoglobin molecule is made of four monomers of hemoglobin. It's a tetrameric, uh, tetrameric molecule. As soon as it comes out into circulation, it breaks down into two components. When it breaks down into two component, the hemoglobin molecule breaks down into dimers. It breaks down into dimers. And these dimers are small molecular weight. So hemoglobin molecule, when it becomes free into circulation, it breaks down into dimers. Dimers are small molecules. And these small molecules of hemoglobin dimers, they can easily, they can easily, hemoglobin dimers. They can easily what? Leak into urine. Because they can easily leak into urine, they can filter into glomeruli. When this hemoglobin dimers are going down, hemoglobin dimer is going down, these cells, what are these cells? Proximal convoluted tubular cell. They love to eat the hemoglobin molecule. They do the process of endocytosis and trap the hemoglobin molecule. They start eating up the hemoglobin molecule by endocytosis. When they take up the hemoglobin molecule, it is highly toxic. It releases the iron, and iron destroys the many structures of these proximal convoluted tubular cells. And acute tubular necrosis can occur. There will be sudden, rapid, acute tubular necrosis can occur. Acute tubular necrosis, we call it ATN. Acute tubular necrosis, it's a very important, you can say, evidence of, evidence of what? Intravascular hemolysis. When you have incompatible uh, blood transfusion, many red blood cells break down into circulation, and a lot of hemoglobin go in, goes into these tubules, and free hemoglobin is taken up by proximal convoluted tubular cells, and they get injured, and acute tubular necrosis occur, and renal failure can occur if there's a heavy load of hemoglobin. It's a toxic molecule. Thank God, normally it is within the RBC membrane. Is that right? So, plus, so, some of free hemoglobin will appear into urine. urine. And we say, your patient will have hemoglobin urea. What thing will be there? Hemoglobin urea. So, what are the evidences of intravascular hemolysis. Heptoglobin will go yeah. down. Free hemoglobin in the blood will produce hemoglobinemia and met hemoglobinemia. There is hemoglobinemia, met hemoglobinemia and in the urine there will be hemoglobin urea yeah. with evidence of redu re reducing renal function if there is heavy hemolysis in the blood. Is that right? Yes. 
Okay. So these are the evidences of which hemolysis? Intravascular hemolysis. What are these evidences? Extravascular hemolysis. Now, the next question you have to ask that whatever hemolysis is going on in your patient, is it acute or chronic? Is it acute or chronic? It is for short duration hemolysis or it's going from long time. So we have to decide there is acute hemolysis or chronic hemolysis. How to answer that question? Very simple. For example, if you have chronic extravascular hemolysis, if you have chronic extravascular hemolysis, is that right? It means unconjugated bilirubin is being produced for a long time. And this unconjugated bilirubin is chronically going into liver, getting conjugated and going down. If for many, many months and years, excessive amount of bilirubin are passing through there, they may make bilirubin stones here. So just a minute. Excuse me, just repeat it from the beginning. We are going to answer that patient has acute or evidence of acute hemolysis or chronic hemolysis. I will tell you evidences of chronic hemolysis, even hemolysis is going for a long time. One evidence of chronic hemolysis is that bilirubin is being produced for very long time. So for a very long time, bilir conjugated bilirubin concentration in gallbladder remain high. And if in the gallbladder for a long time, conjugated bilirubin is coming, this will make bilirubin stones here. And if there are bilirubin stones, they are evidence of chronic hemolysis. For example, if you have a patient who has hemolytic anemia with splenomegaly and gallstones, this is evidence the problem is for a few days or it's for a long time? Long time. Long time. It's a chronic problem. Is that right? Yeah. Then intravascular hemolysis. Is it acute or chronic? Intravascular. Remember, when there is acute intravascular hemolysis, there is free hemoglobin here and free hemoglobin in urine. urine. But if intravascular hemolysis is chronic for a long, long time, mild but chronic hemolysis, then chronically hemoglobin is coming into these cells. Then these cells start handling with the hemoglobin. What they do? They remove these cells. Let me draw one cell big, proximal convoluted tubular. If there's chronic intravascular hemolysis, hemoglobin is chronically coming here. They start removing the iron out of hemoglobin and binding with the apoferritin and producing ferritin and hemocytrates. So what happens? When there's chronic hemolysis going on, especially intravascular hemolysis, small amount of hemoglobin is taken by them. But if there's very heavy hemolysis, these cells will die. But if there's small amount they're taking up, they start removing the iron and storing it as hemosiderin. And then hemosiderin loaded cell will degenerate and come into urine. urine. And hemosiderin loaded cell, when they come into urine, they can be stained by Prussian blue staining method and you can see blue granules of hemosiderin in the these cells and we say patient has hemosiderin in urine and when you have hemosiderin in urine this is called hemosiderin hemosiderin yes urea so when someone has hemosiderin urea it means hemolysis is acute or chronic chronic because to produce hemosiderin here it takes long 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 time is that right any question here? Now, let me ask you a few questions. Little test. If a patient has severe hemolysis going on, if a patient has severe hemolysis going on, what are the evidences of hemolysis? Number one, yes. Unconjugated bilirubin level will go up. Is that right? It will be cholesterol jaundice or a cholesterol jaundice? A cholesterol jaundice because this is not going into urine. Then urobilinogen level in the urine will go yeah. up. And if there is severe yeah. hemolysis, urobilinogen level in the urine will go oh. up. Which enzyme level in the blood will go up? Which enzyme is released by the hemolysis? of LDH. Is that right? LDH level will, in the blood will go up. And which protein in the blood level will go down? Heptoglobin. That's right. If I say there is evidence of accelerated Erythropoiesis, bone marrow will become hypocellular or hypercellular? Hypercellular. Okay. Then uh, there will be slight microcytosis or macrocytosis? Macrocytosis. macrocytosis? There will be monochromia or polychromia? Polychromia. 
and there is increased reticulocyte count or decreased reticulocyte count? Increased. increased reticulocyte count. That's very good. These are the evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. Now, if we have to look for that hemolysis is extravascular or intravascular hemolysis, if hemolysis is occurring in reticular endothelial cells or macrophages, it is which type of hemolysis? Extra. Extra. And if it is occurring into blood circulation, intravascular. If a patient with hemolytic anemia hence had splenomegaly and gallbladder pigment stones, bilirubin stone, it is evidence of chronic, chronic extravascular hemolysis. And if someone has in the blood hemoglobinemia, methemoglobinemia, no heptoglobin, this is all evidence of intravascular hemolysis. This is all evidence of intravascular hemolysis. And if there is also, if patient has in the urine, only free hemoglobin, but no hemosiderin. It is acute intravascular hemolysis. But if a patient has in the urine, hemoglobin plus hemosiderin urea, then it is acute or chronic. Then it is chronic intravascular hemolysis. That's right. Any question here? So this was an introduction to the hemolytic anemias. Yes, please. Yes, what's your question? You mentioned something concerning the aptoglobin, the hemoglobin complex that is destroyed by what? Macrophages. Macrophages. Yeah, in the liver and other areas. Macrophages have receptor for heptoglobin also, right? Okay. So, but the, those receptors of macrophages only bind with that heptoglobin which is complex with hemoglobin. Yeah. Is that right? This is, nature has provided an extra way to remove the hemoglobin rapidly from circulation, okay. right? Any question? Class dismissed.